Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been going through a short series on Sunday mornings called Sword Training 101. Sword Training 101. You might remember Abram had 318 trained servants who were armed with weapons, and they, they helped him when he was rescuing Lot. Remember, Lot had been taken captive. And obviously, you know, the battle that we've just sort of read about there, that was a physical battle that they were involved in. They had physical weapons, you know, most likely swords. They could have had, you know, spears, bows and arrows, all that sort of stuff. But of course, the battle that we're fighting is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. It says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the Bible makes it really clear. You know, we do walk in the flesh, but we're not warring after the flesh. It's not a physical battle that we're fighting. You know, I mean, Ephesians chapter number 6 brings us that quite well. Look at Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then it goes on and says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, many people have pointed out, myself included, that the only attacking weapon that we find in that that sort of list in Ephesians 6 is the word of God. That's only the, really, the only attacking thing. That's true. But it's also true that even the items that are mentioned in this list are actually associated with the word of God. I mean, look at the start. It says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Well, think about truth. I mean, Jesus said the words, you know, I mean, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, we know this is, this is the word of truth that we're talking about here. It says, um, Having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, obviously, there's a couple of different aspects when it comes to righteousness. I mean, Paul said, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. In other words, we have Christ's righteousness imputed unto us. But it's also true that we still do have our own righteousness. We do have both, because we should do what's right. And that's what, I mean, being righteous, that's what it is. Now, is there anyone who, who always does what's right? No, obviously not. Okay, and so you better not rely on that righteousness to get to heaven. But we should still do what is right. But of course, well, how are you going to find out what's right? Well, you find it in here, you know? Um, and it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, the gospel of peace. I mean, this is, this is the gospel. The gospel is, is found within the pages of this book. Um, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, with it shall be quench all the fiery doubts of the wicked. Well, the shield of faith. Well, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we can see, through all of those things, it's, distra- it's actually referring to the, the Bible is very closely um, associated with each one of those things. Now, I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting into the Bible. You know, hearing it, reading it. Paul told Timothy, he said, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So reading, what do you think he's talking about? He's talking about reading. But exhortation, what's exhortation? That's when you're exhorting someone, you're encouraging someone. But what, what are you encouraging them? To, to do what's right, to do the things that it says in here. And then the last thing, it says to doctrine. Well, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine. And so, so it's an important thing we need to understand. I mean, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, here's the thing. Have you read every word of the Bible? Have you read every word of the Bible? Are you, are you going to do it again this year? Maybe you've already done it. Are you going to do it again this year? You know, this, this March, we'll be having our annual, uh, every, mar- every month of March, we have what we call the Bible March. And in the Bible March, we basically, we challenge people to read the whole New Testament in one month. So read the whole New Testament in one month. You might say that sounds like quite a bit. It's actually not that much. If you read nine chapters a day for 29 days, then you'll do it with a couple of days to spare. So, you know... Um, and the thing is it's a worthwhile thing it's a worthwhile thing when we get into God's word when we fill ourselves with God's word, God's word then it'll actually change the way that we live our lives it will change the way that we think 
You know, I mean, Romans, um, Romans 12 says, um, what does it say? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. What does transform mean? Change. Transformed by the renewing of your mind, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we need to be getting into God's word. It's very, very important. Is this something you're going to focus on this year? Are you going to complete that challenge? I was actually thinking maybe we should have another challenge. We could maybe listen... Maybe listen to the New Testament. How about this? So read the whole New Testament in a month. How about this? Listen to the whole New Testament in, I don't know, a week. That'd be a good thing. I mean, we have some, some of our members that are like, you know, there's people who are visually impaired. There's some people who are, can't really quite read at that sort of level yet and they'd find that difficult. But hey, you can listen to it. Yeah. You know, we've got Alexander Scorby. Yeah. Reads it great. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, because it takes 18 hours. 18 hours for Alexander Scorby to read the New Testament. Yeah. That means it would take 18 hours for you to listen to it. Yep. Which means if you did, you know, three hours a day, yeah. guess what, you do it in six days, you have one day, one day left over to spare. And so the thing about it is, because I mean, unlike reading, obviously when you're reading, all you can do is read. You've got to stop and read. And, and it's a good idea to read out loud, but you, you know, you can't really be doing anything else. But when you're listening to the Bible, I mean, you can mow the lawn and listen to the Bible. You know, if you've got decent earmuffs and stuff like that, you can be doing the dishes. You, know, you can be doing your housework. You can be, um, you can be driving in your car. Driving in your car and listen to the Bible, and that's the whole thing. You know, we should be feeding on God's word. Now, it's great to hear the Bible. That's what we, look, that's what we looked about at the, in that first week, hearing the Bible and reading the Bible. It's great to do that. We saw the many benefits also the, the following week of memorizing the Bible. Memorizing the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I mean, everyone's familiar with the when Jesus was tempted by the devil. What did he do? He responded, it is written. It is written. It is written. God's word was in his heart, and that was his defense. You know, he had the sword of the Spirit. It says in Proverbs chapter number 6, verse 21, Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. That's the thing. When you put God's word in your heart, that's one of the reasons why we spend time singing scripture. We sing scripture songs, so then maybe when you wake up in the middle of the night, the song that'll pop into your head is not going to be whatever's on top of the pops, or I don't know, that's pretty, I don't probably have that anymore, but they used to have that a long time ago. But it's, instead of that, it's going to be God's word. God's word is going to speak to you when you're awake in the night. So reading, hearing, memorizing. But here's the thing. In order for the Bible to really be profitable for you, you have to take action. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, taking action. Look if you're at Joshua chapter number 1. This is a, a, a verse we often sing, Joshua chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Joshua chapter number 1 and verse number 8. It says, this book of the law, notice this, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now notice, having God's word and doing what? Reading it. But guess what? Not, re- not just reading it, you know, quietly, but reading it out loud. So notice you've got reading, you've got hearing. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. Day and night, and we looked at the, what the Bible talks about with regards to meditating on God's word. And we think about God's word, and we memorize God's word. But then, not just that, shall meditate in it day and night, that they must observe to do. Notice that, observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then they shall make their way prosperous, and then they shall have good success. You know, reading, hearing, meditating, that's all great. But taking action. Taking action. It is vital to take action. The title of the sermon this morning is Taking Action. This is Sword Trading 101, this is part 3, Taking Action. Turn your foot to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7, very famous um, words where Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter number 7, and he talked about the person who built his house upon the sand versus the person who built his house upon the rock. Look at Matthew chapter number 7, verse 24. He said, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, that's great, hearing God's sayings, and doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So notice, he says, hear these sayings of mine, but what's the difference? They're both here. But one hears and does, and one hears and doesn't do. And here's the thing. The thing, storms are going to come in our life. 
you know, I mean, Sylvia's going to be hoping that when she's out there, there's not going to be many storms on that boat. But, but, <laughs> but storms do come. They come in everyone's life. They come in everyone's life. But here's the thing. If you hear God's word and you do what it says, you'll be able to withstand the storm when it comes. Look, if you would, at, um, look at Ezekiel chapter number 33. Ezekiel chapter number 33. You see, a lot of people have these... Oh, what's the word for it? I mean, any... Christian would say, well, I, I, believe God, I believe what God says, and, you know, yeah, I, I do what God says. Yeah, I don't do it perfectly, but we need to understand that a lot of people say that they believe God. A lot of people say, but words are cheap, you know? It says in um, 1 John 3, it says, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see, it's easy to say words. But it's another thing to do them. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33, verse number 23. Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number uh, 23. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit these wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land. But we are many, and the land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile everyone as neighbor's wife, and shall ye possess the land? Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely they that are in the waste shall fall by the sword, and him that is the open field will I give to the beasts to be devoured. And they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of his strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, and that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate, because of all their abominations which they have committed. So notice, these are people who, you know, God's people, the people of Israel, but what are they doing? What are they actually doing? They're doing all these wicked things, and God says, well, guess what? You're going to reap what you sow. And the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But it doesn't just stop there. Look at verse number 30. He says, also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And speak one to another, everyone to his brother, saying, come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. So notice, these are people saying, let's go and hear what God has to say. Let's go and hear what God has to say. And they come unto thee. As the people come in. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words. But they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo thou art unto them as a very lovely song. Of one that hath a pleasant voice. And can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words. But they do them not. So here's the thing. The problem with these people. They say yeah we want to. Let's go to church. Let's listen to Ezekiel. Let's hear him preach. They hear thy words, but they don't do them. Hearing God's word, but not doing it. Well, what did he say about the person who hears these sayings and doeth them not? It's like a man who built his house upon the sand. And when the flood came, you know, it took it away. Um, look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 42. Jeremiah chapter number 42. Jeremiah chapter number 42. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 42. Look at verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter number 42. And verse number 1 it says, Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Korea, and Jezaniah the son of Hashiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near, and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the, word, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk, and the thing that we may do. So they're coming to Jeremiah and saying, can you tell us, what should we be doing? Go and pray to God, ask him, and come and tell us what, what God's word is, that we may do it. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you, behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass, that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. And it's, a, it's an important principle. It's an important principle that preachers should remember. Don't hold back God's word. You know? I mean, Jeremiah, I think he said in another, another place, he talked about how the word was like fire in his bones and he, and, he, and he couldn't hold it in. He couldn't hold it in. But the fact is, 
there are many people who, they do hold in what God says. They don't actually declare God's word. You know? I mean, he talks about, keep your finger in, in Jeremiah 42, but back at the very start of Jeremiah, he talks about this. He says in Jeremiah chapter number 1, he says, um, Look at verse number 6. Then said I, our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. So Jer- Jeremiah is saying, look, I can't, I can't be a prophet, I can't speak, I'm, I'm just a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So he says, whatever I'm telling you, you need to say what I'm commanding you. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set, these th- set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And so he's telling them, look, this is what you, I'm giving you these words, and you need to go and tell them. But he says to them, look, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of their faces. Because, I mean, did it sound like it was positive news that he was telling them? I said this day over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build and to plant. So those last two sound pretty good, building and planting. That sounds pretty good. What about this rooting out, pulling down, destroying, throwing down? That doesn't sound very positive. It's kind of a similar thing to what um, Paul said to Timothy. You know, that he's supposed to preach the word, and he's supposed to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Notice that, reprove it. That's when you're telling someone, guess what, you're wrong. What you're doing is wrong. Rebuking, that's kind of harsh, telling someone off. And then exhorting, you're telling them to do what's right. You know, but you notice there's, there's actually more negative than there is positive. And I mean, that's kind of true about the Bible. You know, if you read the whole Bible, you know, and, and, and encounter God within it, and you actually discover God's got some, some negative things to say. Sure, there's lots of positive in the Bible. But the Bible's not just a positive book. You know, God is love. Everyone loves to hear that message. That's true. God is love. But God's not just love. God is holy. God is righteous. You know? God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says. You know? So it's important we, it's important we have a balance. You know, just look back at uh, chapter number 42. Jeremiah 42. So we got to him. He said... Um, I'll keep back nothing from you. Verse number five. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God, to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. So it sounds like they're onto it. You know, go and tell us what God says. We'll obey it. It's going to be great. And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then called he Johanan the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people, from the least even to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom he sent me, to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you, and not pull you down. And I will plant you, and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. So it's interesting that some of those same words we just saw in Jeremiah chapter number one. There's, 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 you know, there's that you know, pulling down, plucking up. But notice he says, so I repent me. And when, when the Bible uses the word repent, what the word repent means is it means to change. And specifically, changing your mind. That's what it means, a change of mind. So no, it's interesting here that God's repenting. Some people have this idea that repenting, the word repent means to turn from your sins, be sorry for your sins. That's what the Bible says. Because God repented, he actually repents more than anyone in the, in the Old Testament. He says, For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. But if you say, We will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, there where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, If ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine whereof you are afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt. And there ye shall die. And so here's the thing. He says, look, you have to stay. 
and be under the rule of the king of Babylon. And if you take off to Egypt, what's going to happen? The sword's going to chase you there. And in fact, he goes and gives it, even because they, I think they take Jeremiah down there. In fact, they take Jeremiah down there, and Jeremiah, he like sort of buries some stuff, and he said, guess what? The king of Babylon's going to come and plant his tent right here where I'll put these things. He says, this is what's going to happen. But it's interesting to notice, um, look at verse number, look at verse number 19. It says, the Lord hath said concerning you, O you remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. So this is what God says, don't go into Egypt. Know certainly that I've admonished you this day, he's told them off this day. For ye dissemble in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. And now I have this day declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed it, the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence, in the place where ye desire to go and sojourn. So he's, he's, he knows what they want to do. And lo and behold, look at what he says in the next chapter. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hushiah, and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men, notice that, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt, but to sojourn there. But Barak, the son of Neriah, setteth thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. And so here's the thing. They said, you know, God's word came to them, and they didn't believe it. They said, it, so you go and tell us what God says, and we'll do it. But the reason for that is because they knew what they wanted to do. They didn't really want to hear what God said, because they'd already made up their minds what they wanted to do. And regardless of, you know, I mean... If, if, if Jeremiah told them, go down to Egypt, they're like, oh, great. Because that's what they wanted. But the problem was, they didn't really want to know what God said. They wanted to just do what they wanted to do. Their minds were made up. And it's, it's, kind, of like, it's kind of like in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, where Paul had told Timothy to preach the word, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. He's saying, look, you need to be pre- preaching this word, in season, out of season. In other words, when it's popular, and when it's not popular. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They won't put up with it. But they will heap to their, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and be turned under fables. So the time will come, and don't you think that's the time we live in now, where people, they've turned away their ears from the truth. Not just out in the world, but even in God's churches, people turn away their ears from hearing the truth. Don't need to turn there, but it says in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8, it says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, forever and ever. And obviously that's one of the promises. Guess what? This is, this is the book that's going to be forever and ever. God promised to preserve his word. We have it right here today. We have the, the words of God. A lot of people say, no, we don't have God's word. We've got sort of roughly, you know, I mean, you know, it's been handed down, it's been changed, it's not exactly right. You know, you better go back to some other language to try and get the real meaning of it. That's not what the Bible says. Note it in a table, in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. In fact, Galatians, where I Isaiah says, my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I put in thy mouth, in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. He says, look, your descendants, the, the, the believers that follow after you, they're going to have God's word forever. God's word is not lost. That's why we use the King James Bible, because the King James Bible hasn't changed. You know, these modern Bibles, I mean, if you go, if you go to a, a, um, a Christian bookshop, yep. there's a big pile of King James Bibles there, isn't it? Huge stack. Yeah. Actually, no, there's, there's a small shelf, and there's big stacks of these new Bibles. Lots of new Bibles, you know, the new international version, the, the new King James Bible. Yeah. You know, the, the new, that's the new one, that's where they dug up King James and got them to, got them to sign off on it again? No. If, if the Bible, and we all know the Bible's not a new book, it's an old book. Yeah. If you've got a book that says it's new, you know, the, 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 I'm sure there's other ones, the New American Standard, the, the New Living Translation, the New New, all these new Bibles. They're not the same as this Bible. They're different. They've actually taken verses out. They've altered things around. They've changed. But not only that, 
the whole basis for these new Bibles is the fact that God's word was lost. And we've dug up, we found these scrolls have been lost for hundreds and thousands of years, and now we know closer to what God said. That, that, that's the whole idea behind it. But that doesn't match with what God promised. He says, look, it's going to be in your, your mouth, your seed's mouth, your seed's seed, seed, from henceforth forever. But sorry, we're in Isaiah 30 verse 8. He says, look, this is, what, this is what's supposed to be written there. It says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, that will not hear, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. So they're actually saying, look, don't tell us what the truth is, tell us what we want to hear. Tell us something smooth, something that sounds nice. Look, what is something that a lot of people want to hear? When you go out knocking doors and preach the gospel to people, what do people say to you? People want to think that they can get to heaven by being a good person. Isn't that what you hear? That's what I hear. You know, you hear it all the time out so on. But what does the Bible actually say? Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. I mean, it's an interesting passage where um, someone came in and spoke to Jesus in Mark chapter number 10. Remember the rich young ruler, he comes and speaks to him and he says, You know, good master, what, what good thing must I do that I may have eternal life? Mark chapter number 10, I think it is, in verse number 17. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 17. He says, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now some people, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they take this verse and say, look, that just shows Jesus is not God. He's saying, look, what are you calling me good for? There's none good but one, that is God. But I mean, if you look and see what he says, he says, look, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Is Jesus good? I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses is going to say, yeah, Jesus is good. I mean, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Well, if Jesus said, there is none good but one, and that is God, and he himself said, he is good, well, I guess he must be God. But he says, look, you know, he says, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not be a false witness, defraud not, honour thy father and mother. And he answered, said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. So he's claiming he's kept all the commandments. Like, yeah, I believe that. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So notice, he asked Jesus, Jesus answered him, and what Jesus was really doing, he was just actually pointing out, he was actually pointing out the fact that you can't, you can't make the grade. I mean, he was claiming I've kept all of these commandments. He's okay, well, the problem that I can see that's written all over you is you're covetous. Sell what you have. Give it away. He couldn't do that. He didn't really want to hear it, so he left. Verse, verse, um, verse 23, And Jesus looked round about and saith to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them to tr- that trust in riches? to enter into the kingdom of God. You see, because it's not that money will keep you from being saved. It's not. I mean, Abram, he was very wealthy. I mean, didn't we read he had 318 trained servants? How many, how many people have got 318 servants? Anyone here? No. You know, Abram was very, very wealthy. But the thing is, look, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. That's the problem, when people trust. Well, here's the thing. What are people trusting in? What are most people trusting in to get them to heaven? They're trusting in their good works. They're trusting in their good works. Well, does that agree with what the Bible says? Look at Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 20. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 20. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20. It says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, keeping God's law, being good, doing what's right, which we should do, by that... No flesh will be justified in his sight. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that do what? Believe. Believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at this verse verse, um, 24. Being justified freely. Being justified freely 
It wasn't someone telling you the other day that they don't, they don't believe in cheap grace. Well, look, that's right here. Free grace. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. Notice his righteousness. For the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which doth what? Believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. You see, because the person who's not, who's trusting in their good works, they but well, I'm better than this. this I get to heaven because I'm good. You know, I'm not some murderer. I'm not, I'm not in prison. I'm not, I haven't done these bad, real bad things. But look, when it's all about Jesus, it excludes boasting. In fact, I love verse 28. Therefore we conclude. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You see, we're saved by faith without works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you save through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know? So how does someone actually get saved? Well, it's through God's word. You know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You know? It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Look at James, chapter number 1. James, chapter number 1. James, chapter number 1, in verse number 18. James, chapter number 1. And verse number 18, it says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. He gave birth to us with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness, look at this, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. You see, so we're saved by God's word. But we shouldn't just stop there. Because, I mean, James doesn't just stop there. He then goes on in verse 22 and says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You see, we're talking about taking action. We're talking about doing, you know, as Jesus said, you know, hear, hear these sayings of mine and doeth them. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's like a guy who's looking in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, the path to blessing, it's by not just hearing. It's not just hearing but it's actually doing, taking action. Obviously, when it comes to salvation, there's action people need to take. The action people need to take, they need to put their faith in Jesus. You know, they need to believe. They need to believe. They need to call on the name of the Lord. You know, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We've seen that before. Now, does it, does it need to be audible? Some people say, oh, like, to say, you know, you've got to believe and call, you're sort of adding some sort of work next to you, so you've got to believe and you've got to get baptized, you've got to believe and do this. No, I mean, the Bible talks about it. It's not that it has to be some audible thing. It doesn't have to be audible. Okay? Are, are there any specific words you have to say? No. I remember the thief on the cross where you say, Lord, remember me. You know, that, that doesn't sound like the sinner's prayer. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. But it's an important concept, calling on the name of the Lord. And we were saying before, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at um, John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4 and verse number 10. John chapter number 4 and verse number 10. John 4 verse 10. Jesus speaking with the woman at the well. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Notice, you'd ask. Jesus said, Ask, and you shall receive. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And verse number... Oh, I didn't actually write the verse down, but I'm sure I'll find it here somewhere. Um, verse number 13. It says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. He's actually quoting um, Psalm 116 verse 10, which talks about that. Actually, look... I should have turned there first. Psalm 116. Psalm 116. And verse number... Verse number 10. I believe, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. Look down at verse number... 
Verse number 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. It's important. You have to believe, you have to call, ask. But even after salvation, obviously it's still important we don't just hear the word. It's not that we just hear the word. We should obey the word. We should obey what God says. Look if you were at Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 32. Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 32. It says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So the thing is, the Bible teaches that the Holy Ghost is given to those that obey him. And this, obviously there's two aspects of that. There's two aspects of that. One aspect of that is just simply the fact of, you know, by when you believe the gospel, you call on for salvation, guess what? You get the Holy Ghost. It says in Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 16, Romans chapter 10 and verse number 16, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So how do you obey the gospel? You believe the gospel. Because the gospel is a message of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. Do you believe that? That's what it is. But of course, there's that initial, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit, and the Bible describes in lots of different ways the, the earnest of the Spirit, the, like, like a down payment, you know, you're, you're sealed with the Spirit. But then the Bible also talks about the Holy Spirit coming in power on saved people who are obedient. You know, um, keep your, well, actually, I'll put my finger in Acts chapter number 4, because we'll be there in a second if you were in Acts 5, but in Acts chapter number 4, but look if you're at Psalm 51. Psalm 51. In verse number 7, Psalm 51, in verse number 7, and obviously this is David after he'd committed his great sin with Bathsheba, Psalm 51, look at verse number, verse number 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which has broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So David was talking about the, the Holy Spirit that was on him in power. Remember, the Spirit came upon him, just like it was on Saul before him. And you know, when all the prophets, the Holy Spirit comes upon people. You know, that, that's how, that's how they write the Scriptures. It says, holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. But he says, look, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He wasn't saying restore my salvation. But he's saying, you know, Restore the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. He says, look, I need your spirit upon me in power, so that people will be converted. So that sinners will be converted unto you. Look back at um, Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. You see, the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead us to do what's right when he comes in power. When he comes in power, the Holy Spirit's going to lead us to do what's right. Look at Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 1. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 1. Because you're talking about taking action. We want, it to, we want it to be the right action in our lives. You know, not just taking blind action, I'm just going to do something. But doing what's right. Look at Acts chapter number 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. However, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they bring them out of prison. They asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, notice this, Filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that had been with Jesus. So notice, Peter's got the Holy Spirit dwelling upon him. And what's he doing? He's speaking boldly. In other words, he's, he's just been imprisoned by these people. And, they, and they're saying, look, you can't speak about this 
And he said, what? Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. He spoke boldly. He spoke boldly. Why? Because the power of the Holy Ghost was upon him. It says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Look at, um, look at verse number 15. Verse number 15. And when they commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So they think, you're not allowed to speak. They're just going to threaten them. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. And so look, they threatened them, and they said, doesn't matter, we're just going to keep on doing it. And they did. Look further down, they, they, they prayed down in verse number um, Verse number 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So understand, when the Holy Ghost comes in power upon people, they'll speak boldly. But of course, to have the Holy Spirit come upon you in power, you need to be doing what's right. You need to be doing what's right. Because when you're not doing what's right, what's going to happen? He says, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And obviously it's not that we would ever lose the Holy Spirit. We still always would have the indwelling. But if we want God to use us, if we want God to use us, then we need to be clean vessels. It says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 9, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one, not some, let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That means stop doing what's wrong and do what's right. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he should be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You see, if someone's going to be used, if someone's going to be used by God, they need to be a vessel that's clean. You know, you've ever, ever, been, ever been to the cupboard? Yeah. Grab a glass out? And it's not clean? You know, say the person before you, you know, used the glass and they had a drink of chocolate milk or something and they just put it back in the cupboard and left it there? And you grab it out, it's like, you're going to just pour your water into that and drink it? No. Because you, you don't want to use that one. Why? Because it's not clean. It's not clean. Well, here's the thing. When we're not clean, God's not going to, he's not going to want to use us. That's why throughout the, the New Testament, there's exhortation after exhortation. Look at um, Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. Look at Ephesians chapter number four, verse number 17. Paul writes and he says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Don't behave like the world around you. Don't behave. Be not conformed to this world. He says, Having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He says, put off the old man. Stop doing the old things that you used to do. You used to go to the pub. Guess what? Don't go there anymore. You know, you used to be a layabout. Don't be a layabout anymore. You know, you used to blaspheme. Don't do that anymore. You know, what does he say? He says, you put on, and then you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. You used to tell lies? Stop telling lies. For we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. You see, when we do what's wrong, we're giving the devil place in our life. When we do what's right, we're giving God place in our life. He says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands that thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needed. The Bible says, look, we should work. We should work. In fact, the Bible actually says, if a man will not work, neither should he eat. We should work. 
you know, that's a great principle. That's why we often have, you know, after a soul winning event, we sometimes go out and have something to eat. It's a good principle. You work. You know, the Bible says the labourer is worthy of his reward. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. We talked about that before. You still, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but if your Holy Spirit's dwelling in you, and you're doing what's wrong, it's grieving him. Yeah. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell of Savior. He says, look, we should be walking in love. Now some people get confused, oh, that means you've just got to just be, just be loving to everyone. Just, just, just love everybody, you know, don't ever say a harsh word. But that doesn't line up with what the Bible says. What's about all this reproving, rebuking? Where does that fit in? People have a misunderstanding of what love is. You see, Jesus said, in, in, well, John said, excuse me, but it's God's word anyway. 1 John 5, he said, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. You see, the degree to which we keep God's commandments is the degree to which we love God. You can't separate them. You can't separate them. You know? In 2 John, it says, Now I beseech thee, ladies, notice I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. That's what love is, according to the Bible. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, look, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Look at John, John, that's John 14, 15. Look at John 14, verse number 21. John 14, and verse number 21. He said, look, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how we show our love to God, by keeping his commandments. Verse 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith him, not a scarlet, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus said, Look, I will abide with you. It's like, it's like you know, the Holy Spirit dwelling in power. He's going to abide in what? When you're keeping his commandments. Look at chapter number 15, verse number 4. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. You see, we can't do anything without the power of God, without the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we have God's power resting on us, what are we going to be doing? Bearing fruit. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. You say, what well, are you always talking about soul winning for? Because the Bible puts an emphasis on soul winning. You see, we're talking about what are the actions that we should be taking. Guess what? Going soul winning, that's a great action that we should be taking. You know, Mark chapter number, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse number 37, Jesus said, look, the harvest truly is plenteous. This is what Jesus said. He said, the harvest truly is plenteous. But the labourers are few. And then he said, Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labourers into his harvest. That's what God's about. He wants labourers. He wants people to be working. You know, Mark 16, 15, before Jesus left, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look at Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28, the Great Commission. Everyone's familiar with this. Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, Look, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus said, Look, this is what's supposed to be happening. I've given you this commission. And in fact, he says the same thing. Look at, at um, in Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1. In verse number 
8, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. You see, the Holy Spirit coming in power so that we can be witnesses, so that we can preach the gospel. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, he should follow his steps. Jesus is our example that we should follow. Well, what did Jesus do? If we're going to follow Jesus' example, what was his example that he did? I think Doug's been preaching on it next month. Uh, Matthew 4.19. He said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Following Jesus, because Jesus was a fisher of men. It says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. People say, well, hang on, but but we can't follow Jesus in that aspect. I mean, we we can't save people. Well, there's kind of two ways. I mean, obviously we're not the saviour. We're not, it's not that we go and get crucified and pay for other people's sins. We can't. Like Jesus did. But there is an aspect in which we do save people. We do. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 19, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 19, Paul says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law is without law. Be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So Paul thought that he was going to save people. He thought he was. In chapter number two of, of um, so chapter number seven of, of First Corinthians, verse number sixteen, verse number sixteen, he says, um, "For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband?" Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And this is about when you've got an unbelieving spouse and a, and a believing spouse. But notice what he says. How do you know whether you're going to save them? In other words, the implication is you could. Romans chapter 11, verse number 14. Romans chapter 11, verse 14. And obviously, you, you best not to get in that situation if possible. You know? Marry a believer. Don't, don't put yourself in that. You know? And it's not a good situation to be in. But it can happen. Well, guess what? A lot of people, they get saved after. They get saved after you know, they've already got married. Romans chapter number 11, verse number 14. Romans 11, verse 14 says, If by any means I may provoke to emulation, then which are my flesh, and might save some of them. You know, Jude refers to the same thing. He says, you know, and some have compassion, make a difference. Others save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments, spotted by the flesh. You're there in Romans, look at Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, um, verse number 8, it says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then we sang this before. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see, soul winning is not the only part of the Christian life, but it is a very important part. It's a very important part that should not be downplayed. Last week, the entire church went soul winning after the morning service. The entire church went out. And that, that's pretty uncommon. That's a pretty uncommon thing. I mean, most churches, no one goes out soul winning. You know? But sometimes, yeah, maybe one or two might go out. But that's the whole thing. Why? How shall they preach except they be sent? This is a church where we send people. Now, it's not that we make you do it. We don't put a Bible in your hand and shove you out the door. We say, come with us and we'll show you how to preach the gospel to people. It's an important, important thing. I'm going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. You say, I'm familiar with all these scriptures. Good. You should have them all highlighted and underlined in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, look at verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador? It's someone who speaks on behalf of, you know, like a country or something. 
That's what they, they represent. Well, guess what? We represent Jesus. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. We're speaking on God's behalf. Look at verse number 19. To, to wit or to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Notice, once again, people get saved by the word. But he's committed to us. He's given it to us. Verse number 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us the work to do. That's what a ministry is. The ministry of reconciliation. But look, if you're an ambassador for someone, don't you think you should be like, you know, clean and tidy and, you know, presenting a good image? Definitely. Well, guess what? Obviously, you know, you can have the outward cleanliness. That's, that's a great start. But Jesus talked about we should yeah. need to be clean on the inside. You know, clean on the inside. We want to represent Jesus well. Jesus, he, you know, he says, be ye holy for I am holy. You know, be not conformed to this world. Be different from the world. I mean, what does the world look like? The world's all, the world's all covered in tattoos. Yeah. Aren't they? They're all covered in tattoos. The Bible says, look, don't print marks on yourself. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. Don't make cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. And yet now it's commonplace. You know, men, women. I mean, it looks disgusting. Yeah. The Bible says, you know, we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You know? It says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We need to be doers, not just hearers. We need to be doers. That's what James said. He said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers, not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He looks in his mirror, and he beholds himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You see, when you look into God's word, and you see, look, this is what I should do, or what I shouldn't do. This is what I'm doing wrong, I need to change it. You know, maybe, maybe you're, a, you're a long-haired man, but the Bible says, guess what? You need to cut your hair. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. I mean, there's, there's half a chapter. First Corinthians chapter number 11. It says, It is a shame for a man to have long hair. But a woman, her hair is given her for a glory. You know, it's a good thing for a woman to have long hair. Because why? Men and women are supposed to be different. With the world we live in, men and women, it's like they encourage it. It's like this unisex. It's just all we're the same. That's not what it should be like. We should be different than that. The title of the sermon this morning is Taking Action. Taking Action. You see, it's great to hear the Bible. It's great to read the Bible. It's great to memorize the Bible. But at some point, you need to take action on what the Bible says. You've got to do it. You know? It was great seeing people knocking the door for the first time. That's fantastic. You know? People talking who hadn't talked before. You know? And, and salvation, the doing, involves obviously calling on the name of the Lord, trusting God. But once you're saved, it's very important to take action on what the Bible says. Otherwise, your life and other people's lives, they won't change. They won't change for the better. You know, there's an old saying, you can't steer a parked car. You can't steer a parked car. And that's true. You know, you're sitting in a car, it's not moving. You can turn the wheel, but it doesn't do anything. You've got to actually move. You've got to actually move. Acts chapter 1 verse 1 says, The former treatise have been made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Jesus taught things, but Jesus did things. What did Jesus do? He preached the gospel. Remember, remember to, to, he's talking to Nicodemus. What did he say? He said that, you know, as Moses lifted up the serpent of the, in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not a son to the world to condemn the world, but the world through whom might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus preached the gospel. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me hath everlasting life. He said to, to, to Martha or Mary, I can't remember which one, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? At the end of John, in John chapter number 20, in John chapter number 20, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, As my Father hath sent me, so send I you. Look at, look, look there now. Look at John 20, verse number 19. He says, that, 
Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, so the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. And then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Notice, he says, look, my Father sent me and I'm sending you. He says, receive the Holy Ghost. And he said, guess what? Whose sins you remit, they are remitted. And whoso you retain, they are retained. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, what you do makes a difference. What you do makes a difference. Because if people don't hear, how are they going to believe? And if people don't believe, they're not going to be saved. Now, obviously, we can't actually save people because we've got to force people to believe. It's still their choice. God doesn't force people to believe. But what we can do is we can go and preach. We can preach. And the people that believe, guess what? Their sins are omitted. But the people who we don't go and preach to, that no one goes to preach to, who die in their sins, guess what? Their sins are retained. Their sins are not forgiven. The Bible says, He that believeth not is condemned already. It makes a difference. Last place we'll turn is John 15, because we'll finish off by singing this. John chapter number 15. John 15. It makes a difference in our lives and the life of others. I mean, I started regularly preaching the gospel nine years ago. Nine years ago. Just over nine years ago. And I started door knocking, it would be on the, I think it's the 22nd. So what's today, the 19th? So it's only just about nine years to the day since I started knocking doors. And honestly, my life has been changed by that. I've been saved for a long time before that. But when I actually started doing what God said, it made a difference. It made a big difference. Because it's that car. It's not that you've got to, I'll figure it all out, and then once once I've got it all together. No, it's not about getting it all together. It's actually going and doing what God said. Because when you do it, I mean, John 15, he says, Look, I'm the vine, my father's a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit... He taketh away. If you're not bearing fruit, eventually you're going to not be in church anymore. You're not going to be in church anymore. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So guess what? If you're actually out there bearing fruit, if you're doing what he's telling you to do, guess what? God is going to purge you. What's purging? It's like like pruning a tree so that it can be more fruitful. Well, guess what? You know, you're having trouble getting particular sins out of your life. We should do that. You know, if you're watching filthy things on the TV, if you're listening to wicked music, get rid of those things. But get out there and preach the gospel. And God will help you to get rid of those things. You know, it it, it goes both ways. He says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except the vine the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Look down at verse number... I'll just keep going. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them to the fire they burn. And that's not saying, well, if you're not fruitful, then you're going to go to hell. That's what it's saying. It's going to be a useless branch. You know, men don't cast people into hell. But it's just people that are useless. It's absolutely useless. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. That's what God desires for us. He wants us to take action. Be people of action. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray you'd help each one of us to put these things into practice. It's great to hear the word. It's great to read the word. It's great to memorize the word. But we need to be doers of the word. We need to be doers of the word. Abraham, he had 318 servants. They were were armed. They were trained. But what does training involve? doing. You can't just read something in a book and think you're trained. You've got to actually put it into practice. And the more you do it, the better you get. Lord, we know that's not our own strength. It's not our own power. Without, apart from you, we can do nothing. But Lord, help us to answer that prayer that you told us to pray. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Lord, please send us. As Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. 
We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.